was Mr. Takanaka his talk telling me that uh, he was forced to do it because the United States threatened to hit Japan with HAARP, H-A-A-R-P, if they didn't, okay? Okay, and what would have been the impact of that? I mean, what, tell us what, what that meant to Japan. Earthquakes. So I asked them, is it true? And I have this on tape too. He says, yes, you know, we have to, in order to protect the environment, we need to reduce the world population to 2 billion. And war just doesn't do it, so we're going to try to use disease and starvation. I, I, I use Rockefeller as an abbreviation for this group of inbred aristocratic families, the American side versus the European side. Um, right. But, I mean, the Bushes are part of it, for example. They had two rings. One was a mask of a devil with horns, and the other looked like a wedding ring. And you go like this, and there is a Freemason mark. And he, he, says, to the, he says these horns, he could put a little bit of poison on them, touch me, and I'd be dead. And he tells me he's a ninja, which is a professional assassin. And he says to me, Mr. Fulford, if you want to be, you know, a muckraking journalist, go ahead and do so. But you will die at age 46. However, and he gives me a big Freemason badge. He says, if you don't, the other choice is you can become finance minister of Japan. Okay? So he's offering me a choice between death and the job of finance minister. That's how he describes it. So, you know, we're, we're, we're looting these people's money, but we're not going to kill them, you know. And he said the population in Japan would be reduced to 70 million. But they would allow 70 million to live. And they need about 500 million Asians to keep making toys and stuff. You know, she's describing, you know, massive genocide. I guess a lot of people, the very elite, I'm sure it happens, Mr. Obama and Clinton and anybody else at the high level of U.S. politics, that they're someday, or, or you know, senators, whatever, they're given the same kind of ultimatum. Death or cooperation. So either you join us or you die. And that's how they managed to control the United States and enslave the American people. And I had this great, what I call my Kill Bill moment. You know, there's a scene in the movie Kill Bill, these two women fighting with swords. It looks like it'll be a long, nasty fight. Right. It's not going to be sure who's the winner, right? Yes. And, but one of the women, the bad one, has, a, has a one eye missing. She has a patch. Mm -hmm. And suddenly, she grabs the eye and yes, blinds her and ends the fight. Unbelievable, yeah. Very, very graphic. Very, very graphic, but I thought, hey, why not just target the eye of the pyramid? Because most Westerners don't even know it exists. Uh, I realized the society has six million members. And the Western secret society at the top is only 10,000. So it's six million against 10,000. So suddenly I said, well, that's it. That's it. We can, we can, we've got these bastards. I became the first Westerner in 500 years to join. A bodyguard at that point? Did you hire someone? No. Look, no? if you need a bodyguard, it's too late. Oh. You have to operate at a higher level. I mean, if they really want to shoot me, they're going to shoot me. Uh, you have to make them not want to shoot you. The key to democracy is control over money by the people, not by a secret elite. It's the money that counts. If you lose control over your money, hand it over to people you can't see, you're a slave. It's, that's what you have to remember. Never, ever again let some secret power elite take control of your money away from you. You know, if they're going to try to kill billions of people, then we're going to have to kill 10,000 people in order to prevent that, if necessary. And the arrangements have been made. I'm Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot, mm -hmm. and we're really pleased to be here with Ben Fulford today, former Bureau Chief, uh, Asia Pacific for um, Forbes magazine, which is really fabulous. You did that for six years, I understand. Yeah, about six, yeah. Six. And uh, you've been living and working as a writer and journalist in Japan uh, for 20 years? More than that. I mean, I first came in 1980. Oh, really? student. I went to university here. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. So you went to the University of Tokyo, or what's, what's it called? Well, maybe I should give you my uh, brief background. Um, I was born in Ottawa, Canada in okay. 1961. And when I was six months old, my family moved to Cuba. My father was a Canadian diplomat. Right, okay. Um, he was kicked out uh, 
by Castro because he was helping all these refugees escape. Um, then I lived in Mexico until I was eight. And then from eight to about 16, I lived in Canada, went to a French school. So I, I grew up three, speaking three languages. So you spoke, you Spanish actually spoke Spanish? And English as a child, and then French, you know. From grade, uh, middle school on, it was all in French, so. All right. Uh, and then, you know, I was at the tail end of the hippie era, and I was picking up, like, these echoes from the past that was going on, and this is the, the street wisdom as opposed to what you're learning in school. And, you know, the, the word was that if you went to university, they would just brainwash you into being a consumer, and uh, that, you know, there was something wrong with the world that the grown-ups had made, was sort of the zeitgeist at the time, right? And I decided that if I went to university, I would also be brainwashed. So I decided to escape. I went to the Amazon. I lived with some people, Indians. Uh, How old were you at that time when you... 17. Really? I mean, that's incredibly gutsy to, to do something like that. The Amazon is very... Well, I mean, actually they were former cannibals. <laughs> yeah, but, so... Um, uh, even <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of, you know, hair-raising experiences, you know, machine guns held in my head and all sorts of stuff like that, nearly eaten by a bear, chased by wolves. So you went to the Amazon, you're, you're like 17 years old, and you're not going to college. Did your parents have a problem with that? Well, I mean, what could they do? I mean, I physically left and disappeared. I mean, why, you know. So you're just very independent from a young age? Yeah, I think I was sort of... Um, I mean, I'd go, you know, spending nights out in the wilderness alone, like from age around 12 and stuff. So, wow. Uh, it was, for me, it was just uh, really itching to go. Get Is it, I mean, did your Fulford name, because, you know, we know about, like, your grandfather was, uh, you know, this very well-known Fulford. Was your family considered, uh, um, you know... I don't know, part of the ruling class in Canada at that point well, or sure. not? I mean, my great-grandfather was, you know, what would be today a billionaire and a senator. And my grandfather was an MP, member of parliament for about 20 years. And my father was an ambassador to you know, different countries. So, so you would be considered something of a, of a child of the elite at that point? Sure. At the same time, I had a very unusual upbringing, and we were taught very, from a very young age, you know, to have a lot of empathy, and uh, I was very disturbed by things I saw as a child in Mexico, in mean, uh, extreme poverty. I'll never forget when I uh, was uh, seven, I, was, I met this kid on the street, and we played and talked, and he was the same height as me, and about the same mental, you know, level. And it turns out he was 12. I asked my mother, how could that be? And uh, she said, well, he doesn't have enough food to eat. I said, how could such a thing be allowed to happen? You know, <coughs> and it's happening right now to billions of people. Right. They're not allowed to develop their human potential. They're not getting adequate education, adequate nutrition, um, medical care, nothing. I mean, it's a shame that such things are allowed to happen. At the same time... When I was in the Amazon, you know, it was a beautiful uh, virgin forest, but they told me that in about five years it would be gone because the loggers were coming. And I said, what's, you know, what's out there that's destroying the nature and leaving so many people suffering? How could this be? And to me, it was clear that, and this is what you've got us, you know, in this third world, in the street, at the poor level. There's something right. wrong with the way the Westerners were ruling the planet. Um, and so I decided finally, after lots of, about three and a half years of traveling, adventures, and I, you know, to compensate for not going to university, I read all the holy books, the Koran, the Bible, the Confucius, the Lao Tzu, you know, the Bhagavad Gita, et cetera, et cetera. Great, so you studied, you, were you studying Eastern philosophy, say, before you came to Japan? Um, you know, mystic stuff, you know, like uh -huh. meditating and... and um, I mean, like the I Ching, have you read that? Sure, yeah. Okay. All that kind of stuff. I Great. Mean, um, and, you know, the word on the street level was that something would have to come from the East to help us, right? 
So I finally decided I'd go to university um, in Japan. It was a choice between India, China, and Japan for various reasons. I chose Japan. Uh, Did you know at that point you were going into economics? I mean, I'm assuming that was maybe your major. I just wanted to learn. I didn't think about majors or jobs. I just, in fact, I took every subject there is, I think, uh, right from economics, sociology, anthropology, um, math, biology, you name it. I took up to at least third year level courses in all the courses, in all the subjects. Did you graduate with a degree? I eventually got a degree from the University of British Columbia in Asian Studies with a China Area Specialty. Mm. Um, so you went to British Columbia? To I went to Sophia University in, in Japan for three and a half years. Okay. So it was, I took, like I say, about eight years worth of undergraduate courses, way more than I needed. I mean, um, How did you learn J Japanese? Well, uh, two ways. I, I arrived in Japan. I took a two-month intensive course at the University of British Columbia before coming. And then okay. I arrived in Japan. I spent three days at, an English, at a Japanese school, and I said, this is useless. I got a job as a bartender mm -hmm. in a bar run by a gangster. It was from 9 p.m. to 5 a.m. And it was some sort of place where it had fights, and sometimes people would come in naked. and Very, <laughs> you know, kind of lowest level of Japan you could find, basically. But... The good thing about bartending as a job for uh, learning a language is that drunks keep saying the same thing over and over again. So you eventually pick it up. <laughs> also, I went to what's called Futon University. I used to have a girlfriend who didn't speak English. Oh, okay. It was a combination. But I used to sort of speak like a cross between a, a gangster and um, transvestite, you know. It's kind of uh, either very womanly or very, you know, like low level. Street talk. At this point, that's how yeah. you're describing your, your, your yeah. ability to speak the Japanese language. That's hilarious. Well, um, I was more or less able to carry on a fluent conversation after about six months. Wow. That's great. So do you write Japanese at all? Can you read yeah, it? Yeah, I've written, I think, over a dozen books in Japanese. Oh, right. Published, um, okay. Many of them bestsellers. And I have to know, are your books available in English? Because we, we didn't no, see that. No, no. I mean, I haven't actually. I, you know, I, I deliberately switched to Japanese a few years ago, after I left Forbes, uh, because I knew that I was dealing with something dangerous, and I didn't quite understand what it was. Oh, wow. Uh, I remember being warned, for example, by uh, Makiko Tanaka, the former foreign minister and the daughter of President Kakuei, or Prime Minister Kakuei Tanaka, who was taken down in the Lockheed scandal. And she told me, she said, hey, if you start looking into this stuff, you're going to get killed. So I knew that there was something very dangerous. I didn't know exactly what it was, so I kind of went underground and started writing in Japanese. At but, that point, Ben, could I just ask you, yeah. that, that stuff you referred to, at that point, what was the stuff that you were starting to get into, which you were warned about. At that point, what was the stuff? When I was at Forbes, I had already written several stories about the Yakuza and um, the gangsters. And I got lots of death threats as a result. And uh, now the Moscow bureau chief for Forbes, Paul Klebnikov, was shot 10 times you know, outside of his house, and taken to the hospital and put in the elevator, and the elevator stopped for eight minutes, and that's where he died. Wow. And, and he, what year was this? Do you know, approximately? Five or six years ago, I think. Okay. So you, at the time, were you working for Forbes, or had you I just left? I was working left? for Forbes. He was the Moscow guy. I was the Tokyo guy. So okay. Okay. And around that time, some people from the Asahi newspaper and the TBS television came to me and said that the head of the Goto Crime Syndicate was in UCL, UCLA Berkeley University Hospital getting a liver transplant. Well, this raised a lot of interesting questions. One is, what is a you know, known gangster and criminal doing getting a visa to the U.S.? And why is a 70-year-old guy like that getting bumped to the top of the long waiting list for liver transplants?
Hmm. So I started thinking, well, maybe he was doing some work for the CIA or something. And I was going to write this up in Forbes. And uh, before that, I called up a very senior gangster source I knew. Um, and told him about this. And he said, hey, if you write that, you're going to get turned into fish paste. I said, what? I don't, you know, I don't respond to threats, I said. I said, we never threaten. I said, but, well, I'm a, I'm a well-known journalist. If you kill me, I'm going to cause a lot of trouble. So, well, we won't kill you. You'll just disappear. You'll say goodnight to your girlfriend. And that's it. You'll never be seen again. And then he named a couple of journalists who disappeared. Oh, man. Now, I remember, there was a guy, for example, who wrote about how the Goto gang was selling the old Shinjiko religious sect was importing amphetamines from North Korea and selling them to the Goto gang. Um... And he disappeared after writing a few articles like that. And some of the other Has he ever been found? No, no. A whole bunch of them disappeared. Okay. And uh, a lot of the Japanese journalists told me, you know, the only reason you're still alive is because you're a white guy. We, if we tried to write that same kind of stuff, we'd be dead. Um, so I knew there were some dangerous people. And, and by the way, after when this gangster guy, when I told him about the liver transplant thing, finally he said, look, I won't be able to talk to you again if you write that story. And I thought, okay, this guy is a very senior source, and he's given me a lot of valuable information, and I don't want to lose this connection over one story. So I decided not to write the story. But it was a very kind of bad atmosphere. And then I flew off to Sahalin. What's that? I'm sorry. Uh, in Russia. Oh. You know, um, the Russian Far East, where they have all the oil and gas now. Right. To do a story. And... The local representative of his gang was waiting for me. He took me around, and I was taken to a giant casino with about 400 Chechens standing outside. Mm -hmm. It was like something in a movie. They all had guns, you know, and they were hired by the Japanese gang as bodyguards for their casino. Oh. And Chechens. Chechens, yeah, working for the Japanese gangsters. You know, there's a lot of stuff going on that you just don't see in the surface. Right. Um, well, we just got back from Moscow, actually. Mm. Um, so it's a fascinating place. Well, yeah, so in Asia, you'll find that there's no real line between gangsters and government. It's all a continuum. So you can almost think well, of these Well, some gangsters. would say that's true of, you right. know, the U.S. and Russia. and yeah. well, Sure. In the U.S., I mean, large parts of the CIA are basically organized crime, what they're doing, you know. I right. mean, large parts are honest... Mm -hmm. patriotic people trying to defend their country, but there are groups in there that, you know, as we all know, they, they smuggle drugs and do all sorts of criminal stuff. Right. Um, so I'm sitting in this uh, club, and this guy's beside me. He's really not like the one I knew in Tokyo. He's like a very high-level businessman. This guy is a real thug, real dangerous, and, you know, not a nice guy. And he's very, very tense. And I said, listen, I want to go home. He says, no, no. You can't. Um, you're going to be killed or something, right? And I just realized suddenly I was being set up for a hit. Oh, my. So I, I think quickly, oh, my God. And I point to these two uh, oil men. I said, you don't have to worry about me. See, those guys, they're CIA, and they're guarding me. Plus, I have a file that will go public if anything happens to me. That names names and puts you on jail. It was total bluff, okay? I didn't have any such file. Those guys were just oil men, but, you know... Uh, what can I do? And the guy just gets up, psh, like a rocket, run over the phone, running out the door, psh, you know, like. And I pick up my phone, I call uh, Tokyo, I say, listen, I'm not here to write about your dealings with Russian gangsters and stuff. I'm here to write about the oil industry. I'm not going to cause you any trouble. So the guy comes back, he's all relaxed. And I say, okay, good night. And that's it. But... <laughs> Out of a movie. Yeah, but, but, you know, they really did shoot, the Chechens really did shoot my colleague, you know, didn't they? Um, that was after this happened to me, but... So, once that took place, I did make a file, and I still have it, in hard disks and DVDs with voice recordings and videos. Uh, for example, a well-known Japanese prime minister has murdered three women, and I have the proof in one of these. A um, lot of stuff like that, but... My job is not to try to expose people, okay? That's not where I'm coming from. That's just insurance I had to take out. I don't need that insurance anymore because I have this 
secret society backing me. But again, my idea was, you know, I'm not just trying to expose people. That's not the level I'm at anymore. I'm trying to save the planet. Right. So this stuff will never come out, probably, ever, as long as, you know, they don't kill me, basically. If they do, there'll be horrible repercussions of all sorts. But again, um, I'm trying to make a win-win situation for everybody, okay? So now we go back. What, when I just arrived in Japan, you want to talk about that? Right. Um, well, yeah, but I, I just, I kind of wanted to get a nugget of what it, it was in your Amazon experience that you kind of discovered. Like, what did you, what oh, did the going Amazon. there well, for example, crystallize for you? You see, what I did was, my thinking was, for a, a fish does not know water exists until it jumps. So to understand civilization, I had to leave it. So I tried... Um, Different things. I, uh, in the Amazon, they survived on fish and bananas. So you have roast bananas and fish soup, or banana soup and roast fish, or roast fish and roast bananas. Or, you know, you get the idea, right? I, right. I got tired of it. I said, well, why don't we get some meat? I said, it's okay, we'll go hunting. Spend all day in the jungle. Don't get any, don't catch anything. Come back, we're hungry. There's nothing to eat. So... We lose in civilization that contact between our working and our eating and our surviving. So we kind of so many layers in between actually getting food from the earth and putting it in our mouths that we don't realize sometimes. So that's the thing I learned there. Okay. Uh, the other thing is that these people are much simpler in their communications. They don't, they're very straightforward. They say exactly what they think. So you, you know, so you walk in the room and the first thing they think is, hey, you're fat. They'll say it. Whereas in civilization, it's much more complex. They say, oh, you know, uh, oh, you're looking healthy or something. Or, you know, they, they try not to, you know. Okay. Anyway. You, so there's, the mask is not so, so deep. Yeah. And the other thing is they're, well, these people were former cannibals. So the, the, old, the elders they all used to eat human meat when they were young. And, and it was they explained to me that in the rainy season, they couldn't get enough fish, so the only way to get protein was to eat their neighbors. Now they survive with canned fish um, in the <laughs> rainy season. But uh, okay, but did you go there by yourself? I just have to know. Yeah, completely just, alone. Yeah, I hitchhiked and got in a boat and just kind of arrived. Unbelievable. At the okay. Well, well you, you must see, have an incredibly had, strong personality. I had read, you know, the teachings of Don Juan. Yeah. Right, and I was looking for a witch doctor. Okay. To do an apprenticeship. I see. I actually found a witch doctor and did do an apprenticeship in okay. the Amazon. So that's so why I went. So you had some training in, in magic. Yeah, <laughs> so. I, you know, I can purge river spirits and stuff from you if you need it. You know. Okay. And, uh, Good to hear. I know some hear. of the herbs and plants and. <laughs> right. I did a lot of this stuff called ayahuasca, which. Um, oh, that's like a trippy drug, right? Uh, yeah. At the time, there was almost nothing written about it in English, right? Mm -hmm. And. Like I said, I had to go right up to the upper reaches of the Ukuyali River and out to find the Shipibo Indians to find the stuff. So you can imagine my surprise when I see it for sale on the street here uh, as a legal drug <laughs> years later, uh, which it shouldn't be. You mean be. here in Tokyo? Yeah. Okay. That's interesting. Well, there's no specific law against it. But anyway... Um, so fast forward, you're here, you're in Tokyo, mm -hmm. you've gone to college, and... I, did you go to apply for to work for Forbes at that point? I don't know. No, my first job um, was, well, yeah, I wanted to write a theory of everything. Um, but, you know, you can't really pay the bills that way. So the, the first job I got was, was with an outfit called Knight Ritter, which was part of the Knight Ritter newspaper chain. So it was right. a, but it was their financial wire. So... Uh, I would go and meet the finance ministers and governors of Bank of Japan and stuff, and mm -hmm. all the market news. So uh, my stories would move the dollar, or move the yen, or move the price of commodities every week, just back and forth. And it's, it's really amazing to see that what I learned there as a financial market reporter is that it's really finance is mass psychology. Mm -hmm. It's mob psychology. Um, 
And that was a very interesting lesson that you don't learn in the school club, you know. So you learned, like, the power of the written word at that point, right? Well, it's the information and how they all have this story that they're following. And, and they're looking for slight changes. For example, you see governor of the Bank of Japan says, well, we might tighten interest rates a bit. And everything moves, right? Mm -hmm. um, or even for the commodity markets, uh, rumors that China is going to buy oil or something like that, cause everything to move. Um, but, but tell me something about your background, because we listened to this interview with the Canadian radio, and, and you show an incredible understanding about the economy of the world, really. And well, how, what makes it tick? And I'm just wondering, where did you learn everything that you learned okay, in that well, way? Well, of course, I did all the, you know, the university classes and right. economics and stuff. But basically, for over 20 years, I've been following it, writing about it. I mean, everybody comes through Tokyo. Presidents, prime ministers, finance ministers. They have their G7s and all that stuff. G7 is here right now, as yeah. you may know. I mean, so, yeah, so I've been following it um, for over 20 years at the highest level and okay. I've been interviewing gangsters, prime ministers, finance ministers, presidents of big companies, presidents of small companies, you know, just more than 20 years, almost 30 years interviewing all sorts so of people. So it's an education in itself, I guess, interviewing yeah. and, as and, we find. And as, as a journalist, you know, you find that your job is a filter. You suck in huge amounts of information and, mm -hmm. and look for the nuggets uh, that are easy to understand and convey the essence. Mm -hmm. And you give that to the public. So, so that's the job, you know. You're an information filter. But there are a lot of other financial journalists out there who are towing the party line. Well, and this is categorically what you haven't been doing. You're a real maverick in this field. Well, you see, it's very high-level propaganda. They're brainwashed. They really, really do not understand at the essence of what it's all about. Um, and that's the trick. They're, they try to get people sidetracked into esoteric mathematics, and they try to cover it with lots of complex words. So, you know, they come up with these derivatives that are so complex that most people don't even understand what they mean anymore. Like I remember even almost 15 years ago or more talking about delta hedge formations and you know and, and so they get into this stuff and it blinds them. It's like almost a deliberate you know uh, confusion because at the essence it's really very simple. Economics is people working to earn their living. And finance is a process of deciding what people will do next. And they try to not let us understand this, especially the part about finance. And that is the, the key to the world's problems now. So how did you, as a journalist for Forbes, did it, was it gradual the way that you... Because I can imagine if you have this knowledge that you have and you have this approach, as a journalist, don't you, didn't you get pushback from Forbes saying, no, don't write this or don't, right, or, me, don't Okay, maybe I should give way. you, I'll, 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 I'll show you how I discovered things in chronological order, maybe the easiest way. Um, first thing I noticed in Japan that everything was not as it seemed was when I saw some people lined up at a little booth. And I said, what are you doing? I said, well, we're exchanging our prizes for money from the pachinko which is a kind of slot machine. And you find out that they have a huge gambling industry with giant neon signs everywhere that's basically illegal. And yet it functions openly and with rules. For example, no matter how hard you could try, it's going to be hard to lose more than $1,000 a day at those places. Mm -hmm. So here we have a whole system outside of the legal framework. And it connects policemen, gangsters, and businessmen all outside of the so-called legal apparatus. So this is something that made me realize something was different about this country. It was not just a Asian version of Canada, which on the surface it is. They have the upper house, the lower house, you know, they have the courts and everything. So structurally it's the same, but in essence it's totally different. What I learned was that this so-called legal democratic system was a front for a very different 
a real power structure. Okay. This is something that I, you know, I learned in tidbits. Uh, but the first was a pachinko. Another one was a friend of mine got beaten up by a gangster in front of a police box. He went to the police box, and the police box guy said, the policeman said, you shouldn't pick fights with gangsters. That's it. Um, so, again, I said, geez, and that's weird. But, again, I thought this was just related to gambling and prostitution, which is kind of a gray area anywhere, anywhere, really. So, you know, I didn't think much about it until as a financial journalist with the wire service, it's very important to be quick. To beat, if you beat your competitors by 30 seconds, it's considered a big scoop. Right. So you have to find out where the power comes from. And talking, for example, to the bureaucrats at the agriculture ministry, they said, well, if you want to know what's really happening, you talk to Mr. Kato, Koichi Kato. He was a LDP power broker. And he was a man making decisions then. And he once, so I got to know him. And he once, I got called to, as a pinch hitter for one of his speeches. And then he came up and made his speech. And it was very impressive. And then he got a big fat envelope of cash. I said, oh, politics, ah, you know, <laughs> certain day. And then uh, I thought the finance ministry was the real source of power in Japan. That's what people believe. It was the most powerful bureaucracy. But when I started talking to finance minister people, uh, when I started talking to people at the finance ministry, they told me, finally, if you really want to know what's going on, you have to go to Nomura Securities. And this was in the 80s. It's different now. But in the 80s, <coughs> during the bubble, Nomura Securities had a VIP list of 5,000 people. And they had these two bosses, the big Tabuchi and the little Tabuchi, uh, not related, who were later proved to be connected to a big gang, crime gang. But they would take all these journalists, politicians, come, you, know, all, you know, the sort of top movers and shakers, and they'd lend them a couple million dollars. And they'd say, buy this stock. And then they would take every salesman in the country and all their journalistic connections and say, these are the stocks you've got to buy now. And every housewife and small businessman and doctor would buy these stocks, the price would go up, and the VIPs would sell. So that was how they controlled politics. So no, you say it's different now, so how is it different? Well, it's different players, different uh, ways of handing out the money. Um, and in fact, that is the, the core of the problem which we're dealing with. We'll, we'll, we'll do this step by step because yeah. it's easier to see the whole story then. So I got quite cynical about Japan. Uh, but the real clincher for me was the, the Jusen housing loan scandal. This was a bunch of companies that lent only for real estate. And after the Japanese bubble burst, it was the first time they were going to use taxpayer money. By the way, in 1992, the Japanese government already knew they had 200 trillion yen in bad debt. But the newspapers only said 2 or 3 trillion. And it wasn't until more than 10 years later they finally admitted the whole number. And that's what's happening in the U.S. right now. Only they're not going to have 10 years because they didn't borrow it from other Americans. They borrowed it from the rest of the world. So right. you'll see huge changes there. But we'll get to that. Okay. Anyway. This is a question I'd like to bookmark because I remember that you said to Rents that you felt that, in your opinion, the U.S. debt was $120 trillion. And I went and looked it up and I thought, I wonder where that figure comes from. So I'd like to ask you that. Well, I can tell you right now, the... the the $66 trillion comes from the, the essay by uh, Professor Kilborn that was published by the St. Louis uh, Federal Reserve Board branch in 2005. And that's the money they owe to American citizens. Um, you know, stuff they promised to pay, like uh, Medicaid and uh, Social Security and things like that. It's in that essay. You can find it. Now, the other $53 trillion is the amount of dollars out in circulation outside of the U.S. It's the amount of... I gotcha. So add them together and you get $120 trillion. Wait, $120 is a lot. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you've only That's got a GDP deep. of $13 trillion. Well, You know, this, mm. this is where the whole scam un unravels. But we'll, we'll get to that. But okay. it's... it's um, okay, so this housing, you've got the housing... All right, so here's the point is that they were going I was working for the Nihon Keizai Shimbun at this point it's like the Japanese Wall Street Journal it's in Japanese but it's okay. their number one business finance newspaper by far 
and they were talking about pouring in tens of billions of dollars in taxpayer money to bail out these companies. And there were some weird discussions about uh, borrower responsibility. Borrower responsibility, what's going on here? And so I sort of said, well, who are these borrowers? And it turns out, this is my sources were people at the Bank of Japan and uh, various other agencies, like uh, credit rating agencies, that more than half the loans were made to gangsters, to Yakuza gangs. So it was very, to me, it was an amazing thing. Here we have the government using tens of billions of dollars of taxpayer money to bail out uh, companies that lent money to gangsters. And they were all headed by former finance ministry officials. So you see a link now between the finance ministry officials, uh, politicians, and gangsters. And they're using taxpayer money to give to the gangsters, right? So uh, I wrote this up in the English Nikkei, and there was a huge reaction. Over 400 foreign journalists or magazines wrote similar stories. Half the juice and housing loans were went to gangsters, right? And then Newsweek wrote a story, almost identical to mine. And then the Nikkei, their own paper, said, according to Newsweek, half the loans to the housing, to the juice and companies, are to Yaksa. And I went to the editor. I said, "Hey, I wrote that story first. Why do you say according to Newsweek?" And they called me up and they gave me the editor's award and uh, $50. <laughs> and then they told me, um, Mr. Fulford, you know, re you really shouldn't write stuff like that. It's just not done and it could be dangerous. And after that, they started watching me. And they would not let me write anything except the stuff the government announced. Wow. So and this is after you left Forbes. You're writing before, for the... Before I got to Forbes. Oh, before you got to Forbes. Okay. Right? So I started to realize the Japanese press was not at all free. I see. And, uh, you know, it turns out there was an editor at the Nikkei, Mr. Otsuka, who won a bunch of awards for writing about the Itoman scandal, which, and then he was suddenly sent off to some weird subdivision, removed from the reporting business, and he got very suspicious. He started following the president around. It turns out they lent like $100 million to gangsters, money that would never come back. And the Itoman scandal was another huge one, which basically Japan's, one of Japan's largest banks, the Sumitomo Bank, had been taken over by a crime syndicate. Mm. That's what the story really boiled down to. It's a, it's a long, complicated thing, but... Um, anyway, I started to realize that the, the newspapers and the politicians and the bureaucrats and the gangsters were all in together in some kind of crooked power structure that was totally different from what people were seeing on their television or reading in their newspapers. Mm -hmm. And I got totally disgusted when they started suppressing my stories. So I quit the Nikkei. Uh, I worked as a freelancer for South China Morning Post, a bunch of places, before I got the job with Forbes. Okay. Uh, and at first, the f people at Forbes were happy to let me write stories about gangsters. Uh, I did one on public works that got a formal letter of protest from the Japanese embassy in Washington, which is, I thought, you know, good, I, I, I hit a sore point, right? Um, and then there was another story I did when they were finally starting to clear up the bad debt with the banks. I was finding all sorts of people were dying. And this is either committing suicide or, you know, d disappearing, whatever. But it was not a typical, what you call, harakiri suicides where you did something bad and you kill yourself to apologize. It was people who were going to testify, people who were going to, uh, yeah, I mean, pers uh, prosecute people. For example, the, there was a financial scandal and the president of Daiichi Kangyo Bank, which is now part of Mizuho, uh, was due to testify. The day before he was going to testify, at 11 o'clock at night, his wife left the house. And about 10 men in black clothing showed up. The lights turned off. And then they left. And around 1 a.m., 
the wife came home and he was dead. Uh, and they said it was a suicide. Now this came from the English version of the Yomiuri newspaper. It did not appear in the Japanese version. Okay? Now, so I then, at this point, I made lots of gangster connections because I realized that to understand what's going on in finance, you need to not talk to gangsters. Otherwise, you don't know what is going on at all. Okay. Uh, and so there was a bank called the Nippon Credit Bank that turned into Aozora Bank. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's now owned by some one of those U.S. hedge funds, maybe Carlisle, I can't remember, I have to check. But anyway, um, um, the director from the Bank of Japan, Mr. Honma, was made president. And two weeks later, he was found hung. And they said it was a suicide. Hmm. And I knew this guy from when I used to cover the Bank of Japan. I said, no way he could, could have committed suicide. So I asked my gangster buddy. And he said, well, I'll check out with the guys down in uh, Osaka. And he calls him, and I meet him again. He says, well, what happened was they pointed a gun at him, told him to write his will, and they injected him with a sleeping drug, and they hung him. And I, of course, I cannot write a story based on an anonymous gangster. And I knew he was a gangster because I had a detective agency confirm for me that he really was what he said he was. He was a senior boss of one of the biggest gangs. Um, so I called the hotel and they, where they found his body and said, yeah, well, you know the place they found the body? Well, there's nowhere to hang himself from, right? So I called the police and said, well, you said you found the body by the window, but there's nowhere to hang himself by the window. So the police changed it and said, oh, well, we found him in the bathroom. And there was a Japanese uh, TV personality in the room next door, Mori Kumiko, or Kumiko Mori. She, in Japan, she does the voice of Pikachu, you know, from the, uh, what is it, Pocket Monsters? Oh, anyway. yeah, Pokemon? Anyway, she's well known in Japan. Okay. And she wrote in her blog that there was screaming and moaning in the room next door, and she couldn't sleep, and there was no way that could have been a suicide. And I confirmed that with her manager. Uh, and apparently... He was killed because a bunch of loans to North Korean credit cooperatives. He was going to call them as bad loans. And if he did that, he would have exposed a huge North Korean ruling party underground link. The North Koreans have been uh, sending pachinko money to Japan, importing amphetamines, doing all sorts of stuff. And to get the police to turn a blind eye, they paid huge bribes to the ruling party over the years. Uh, so, Did you write about this? I wrote it in Forbes, yeah. Yeah? Yeah, it's there. Um, although, you know, the editors are such chickens that they, they really took a lot of that, out of that story, but it's still there. You can still okay. find it. So I started digging deeper. But then, suddenly, Forbes starts putting pressure on me. I had a story about GE doing some very funky accounting here with, involving billions of dollars. That, you know, they killed it without explanation. And then really? Citigroup was kicked out of Japan for you know, money laundering uh, for gangsters. They were kicked out. And that story didn't run, right? Um, and finally, what for me was the last straw was a antivirus software company paid a guy to make a virus, a computer virus, right? And I talked to the guy who made the virus, you know, and he's some, he's supposed to, some guy living in a Filipino slum, but he's got a brand new $20,000 car, you know. And anyway, they said to me, well, this guy, this president of the company, is a friend of Mr. Forbes, and he bought a lot of advertising, and so we're not running a story. Oh. So they told you that, they actually told you the well, reason? Well, the editor told me that, you know, we have problems with your facts, Mr. Fulford, you know, fact-checking. This is their, their trick. They, they raise the hurdle higher and higher. Facts. For example, you saw them in bed together. Are you sure? That doesn't mean they're making love. Was there a blanket on top? No, there's no blanket. Well, did, did you see the actual penetration? Well, no, his butt was in the way. Oh, well, then we don't know. You can't confirm it. Sorry. That's, that's their trick. That's how they train the corporate media. They, they raise okay, so the facts. But, but anyway... The, the business manager told me oh, the real reason okay. that the advertising and, and stuff. So, you know, I get one thing from the editor, another thing from the business manager. So right. uh, I got totally disgusted and alienated, right? Mm -hmm. And so after that, the quality of my work at Forbes degenerated because I just didn't give a damn. And I was going to quit. I was getting ready to quit. I, at that point, a, a book, 
of mine appeared in Japanese, became a bestseller. So I didn't need the income. Um, a book about what? Well, just it, the first... This isn't the Rockefeller one, is it? No, 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 no. This is stuff that came out a, a long time ago. Some of the stuff I just told you uh, about the, the murders and the other stuff going on. It was about Japanese corruption. Um, and a lot of people in Japan were, you know, knew something like this was going on. And so anyway, I wrote several bestsellers like that. Okay. So I had an independent income. Uh, but... What really made things click for me was I was on a TV debate show with some of Japan's top politicians. And I said, these are the guys running this country? Come on, you gotta give me a break. They're retards. I'm sorry to say this, but they're not high caliber. Okay, I'm, I'm debating them. I said, what on earth is going on? Now I know, of course, they're just actors reading a script, but at the time I thought, you know, my God, I could do better. And then I suddenly, it was like, it was too enormous, the, the thought, but I realized, oh my God, the Japanese have five trillion dollars in overseas assets. That's enough money to end poverty and stop environmental destruction. Well, why don't they use it? And I decided, hell, you know, I could become a cynical alcoholic you know, foreign correspondent old fart, like I see so many of at the foreign correspondence club, you know, who just, they, their careers plow out and they just spend years coasting along and getting bitter and cynical. Right. And I said, no, hell with that. I'll become a Japanese citizen. I'll try to run for office and I'll try to convince them to use this money to save the world. You know, that makes so much sense. But um, at the same time, though, I was very confused and bitter, right? And I wasn't, you know, so another part of me was saying, well, you should write a book about Japan and then leave the country and go to Hollywood, try to become a scriptwriter or something. So it's two conflicting ideas in my mind. You know, I had that one idea, but it's just too big and too, it's no, no, you know, it just can't be real, right? <laughs> but, so I wrote two chapters that would have really, you know, name names, you know, specific politicians, specific crimes, specific gangsters. Uh, and it would have been so much of an expose that, that would have, I would have had to either leave Japan or be killed after the book was published. Mm -hmm. The very day after I sent two chapters to my agent in English, I got a call from the granddaughter of the Meiji Emperor, uh, Kaoru Nakamaru. And she said to me, you know, Mr. Fulford, you really should not get the Yakuza angry. And are you sure that's what you really want to do? Isn't there something else you'd rather do? And I say, you know, why is this lady calling me at this timing? And she tells me that a goddess had contacted her through the astral plane and was worried about me. Well, it turns out the goddess was the Japanese security police. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, whatever. She still okay. insists it's a goddess. Only one time did she tell me it was the police. Every other time she says it's a goddess. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It was the timing. And it, what you really want to do is not something else. And I realized, yes, you know, I want to save the world. And unlike so many people want to do that, I actually had a concrete method. So it was $5 trillion. Well, that's enough money. And... You can't take that money out of the U.S. because that would ruin the U.S. economy. So you have to pay Americans to do it, right? So that they benefit as well. Otherwise, you know, in the, in the past, what happened is if a Japanese politician threatens to take that money out of the U.S., well, then the U.S. is going to be really angry and try to crush that politician, right? So I think, okay, well, we'll do it in such a way that the Americans benefit too. Then they can't complain. And this is what I started setting out. I started writing books along those lines. Why don't the Japanese save the world? Okay. And, but what the, what happened though, you see, with this um, Meiji Emperor's granddaughter handed me a 911 video and said, look, Mr. Fulford, you know all about the corruption in Japan, but you have no idea about the corruption in the world. Right? Okay. And when she gave me that, I was shocked. I said, oh my God. I read about this in the New York Times. This is some anti-Semitic thing. I'm not going to look at that, you know, because we've all been trained. Anti-Semitic equals 
Nazi, which equals gas chambers, right? And you don't want to be involved with people who want to kill millions of innocent people, right? So this is the sort of thinking I had. So I wasn't even going to look at it. Because I had it all associated. And she kept calling me, did you watch it? No, did you watch it? And finally I said, oh man, I'll watch 10 minutes so I can tell her that I watched it. And when I did, it was like the scales fell off my eyes, as they say in Japanese. It's like, remember, I was a financial journalist for a long time. And because so many people read what you write, it moves markets. So you have a constant barrage of people trying to feed you BS information, which means you build very high immunity to false information. Okay. So I knew... I mean, I, you know, this is something very, very weird. Because, and the problem most people at the high level of Western society have with the 911 thing is they say, well, no, because I don't care what evidence they show me. There's no way on earth that the New York Times, Washington Post, BBC wouldn't be reporting this. You know, because to accept that it was a cabal in the U.S. government that did this, it means to accept that the entire belief system you have about your society is wrong. Mm -hmm. But having experienced what I did at Forbes with censorship and what I knew about the Japanese corruption stuff, so, you know, I started to do the research, mm -hmm. find out what's been going on here. And the answer is essentially that European society is not really democratic anymore. It's a plutocracy combined with an aristocracy, and the democracy is kind of a way of keeping tabs on the sheep sentiment, you know, keeping them, giving them a way to vent their frustrations within very restricted boundaries. This is, so, uh, you know, there's many different words out there that people use. And it makes it very hard. A lot of people have trouble even now believing this stuff. So but what I'm able to do is I can show you within the normal matrix of financial reports, Wall Street Journal stuff, how to trace it. Okay? And what you need to do, and what I did finally to figure this out, is you go back to 1918 edition of Forbes, their first rich list. And you find that seven of the, what is it? The top 10 richest Americans controlled 70% of the money in the country. Mm -hmm. uh, John Rockefeller, the first, was worth about 30 billion in today's money. And I think he controlled 25% of all the wealth in the US at the time. And what happened was, the reason why the Rockefellers do not appear as so rich in the Forbes list, and remember, I was, you know, one of my jobs was to identify billionaires and count their money, it was because it's put in as a charitable foundation. And in fact, they have hundreds of them. Rockefeller, Carnegie, Brookings, you know, Hudson, the right. whole alphabet soup of them. But each generation of the Rockefeller families and the other families, the Morgans, which are the Bush, you know, people and stuff, uh, you can see that they inherit the power. They still control that money. And they have a system so that each generation has one person in charge. So it's like a kind of hidden aristocracy. Instead of inheriting land, they inherit assets. Mm -hmm. And everybody who works within those assets is like a peasant working on the Lord's estate. So if you work for Standard Oil, you're a Rockefeller surf, in a way, because they have the ultimate control. Okay, that's the Rockefeller side of things. Are you also able to trace it from the Rothschild, Rothschilds, the European side? Yeah. Um, now, the Rothschild thing goes back 300 years, basically. I think this is well-known stuff, but I can summarize it for you. You know, there was the, the first Rothschild to appear set up in Frankfurt with a red shield. He changed his name, Red Shield, right? Rothschild. Uh, and the local king was going to get involved in a war. And uh, Rothschild said, hey, I'll lend you a bunch of money. And if you win, 
if you lose, you don't have to pay me back. If you win, I'd like to be your banker. And of course, when he had all this extra money, he could hire lots of more extra soldiers, and he won. And here we have the beginning of a link between royalty and finance. Kings like wars. Wars cost money. Um, and a process of intermarriage between these financial and aristocratic families began. That right. is, you know, well, it's been going on for 300 years. But the next big thing is we go to, he had five sons. And they were set to different parts of Europe. And they had, you know, they were only bankers to kings. They, they tried to, you know, at the very highest level. And Nathan Rothschild went to England. He started out buying... Um, cloth and selling it. And then he sort of, you know, realizing if I control the dye makers and the cloth maker and put, put it all together, I can make more profit. And so he was a exporting British textiles at first. He got richer and richer. And uh, his big, big coup came in the Battle of Waterloo, where at the British exchange, everyone was wondering, you know, if the British were going to win or lose, right? And they knew the Rothschilds had very fast information, quicker than anyone else. My assumption is they were involved in insider trading with the king. Okay? Because suddenly Rothschild started selling everything. Just sell whatever you got. Sell, sell, sell. And everyone thought, oh my God, the British lost, the British lost. And stuff that was worth 100 would fall down like two or three. And everyone panicked. They said, oh my God, sell while you have a chance. You know, we're, gonna, we're all going to be you know, Napoleonic slaves anyway. Uh, and then, when it fell down, he started buying it all up. And the news came. The British won. And it had been 100 rose to 200. And he controlled most of the British wealth after that time. And he said, I don't care, you know, this is a famous quote, I don't know the exact words, but what fool sits in the crown of England? Whoever controls the money of England controls England, and I control the money of England. However, you know, um, I think the Rothschilds, had a very deep religious convictions and were at heart fairly decent people. I, the reason I say that is because although they, they apparently financed and engineered the U.S. Revolution in 1776 with the East India Company money, um, they also financed and engineered the Meiji reforms. But these are good things, you know, in many ways. Um, Canada was always been Rothschild territory and Canada's a very nice country. You know, uh, so I don't think they're the same level. I mean, they did a lot. They had, their system was basically, you know, uh, ancient Babylonian royalty. And this is where it gets really weird and esoteric, but um, it goes back 5,771 years. The Rothschilds used to say they were descendants of Nimrod, who conquered the peoples of Babylonia. They were a um, herding people, a pastoral people. And they conquered the people of Babylonia, or present-day Iraq. And they said, well, isn't there some way we can herd people the way you herd sheep? And they came up with a system. You have to control their food supply, you have to control their information supply, and you have to have um, means of violence to discipline them. And this was the start of the Bible, the Old Testament, was they, they took all the different stories people had and put it into one story. And this is the only story people are allowed to have.